Shabbat Shalom. It's really wonderful to yes. um, fellowship with the brethren Amen. on the Shabbat Amen. and uh, to be encouraged and uh, encouraging one another through words, through yes. songs, yes. through prayers, yes. and through the presence of each one. Yes. Now let us pray so the Lord's um, uh, presence be upon us yes. and that he will open our eyes and our yes. hearts yes. to understand the scripture in accordance to his will. Let us pray. Avino Malkeinu, our, our Father and our King, we thank you, O Lord, for this Shabbat. Yes. We thank you, Lord, for you have given us rest. And every week you remind us that there will be a rest that is coming for us when the Lord comes, your Son. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we fellowship with one another, O Lord, on this day, may you be magnified, may you be glorified, may you be praised. We pray, Lord, that may you open our eyes and our hearts and our minds that we can understand your word. And we pray, Lord, that uh, as we study your word, help us to understand. And most of all, help us to apply it in our lives and give glory to you. We praise you, we honor you, we magnify your name. This we pray in the most precious name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord, our Master, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Understanding the book of Galatians from the proper biblical perspective. The epistle to the Galatians is one of the most misunderstood book in the Brit Kadashah, the New York Covenant. Time and time again, this book was used as an excuse to avoid doing biblical commandments and to refute and confuse those who want to follow the biblical statutes and ordinances. Is the book of Galatians the ultimate book to silence the whole Torah? If you look at certain passages in there, it appears that indeed the law has been done away with. If it is, then there is a conflicting passage in the scripture making the Bible inconsistent. In this study, we will use the methods of hermeneutics, the Christian exegesis to interpret biblical passages, and in this case, the book of Galatians. Hermeneutics. We are aware that meaningful communication is difficult even at the ordinary human level. The meaning of what was said can easily be distorted or misunderstood. Even at the language level, we know that it is flexible and could mean in different ways depending on period of time, places, and nationalities, among other things. Language and its meaning constantly change. For example, during Shakespeare's day, physics means laxatives or other medicines. And, but physics today was known before as a natural philosophy. So change of terminology over time. Linguistic issues are constantly a challenge in biblical interpretation. The Bible is 66 books in one, written by many authors from different places over a span of around 1,500 years. Inasmuch as the Bible is what is called God's word in human language. The interpreter, that's us and whoever is the reader, is finite, fallible, human creature, but must try to see things from God's point of view. Man, however, fails time and time again, and as a result, created at least 48,000 denominations in the span of 2,000 years. They cannot be all right. Maybe if you are right, Maybe they are all wrong. We don't know. Over the years, Christian theologians trained themselves in the discipline called hermeneutics. That is a Greek for interpretation. And they worked out canons or rules, that's the meaning of canons, for translating and interpreting scriptures. From generation to generation, scholars recorded their exegesis. That is Greek for explanation. So we're studying two words here. The hermeneutics, which is the interpretation, and exegesis, 
which is the explanation of that interpretation. And there should be rules, otherwise it is chaotic, just like what's happening right now. Right? This is a process, exegesis is a process of taking out of a text and its intended meaning. It came from the Greek word exegiomai, which is the word used to describe or disclose a document. Exegesis is not used in third is not used interchangeably with hermeneutics. They are different, but close enough. In Luke 24, 35, it says there, the disciples exegeted or told what had happened to them in the road to Emmaus. That's the word that they, they use there, exegeted. Now, Hermeneutics deals with the broad principles or rules of interpretation governing biblical exegesis. The learner need to search the proper meaning employing historical, what happened during that time, critical, why did the author said that, linguistic, how was it written and its original language, and cultural understanding which is what was their culture, right? Is there a way to, because the, the bottom is, um, this one? Yeah, so, yeah, so just a little bit, so we can see. Yeah, just a little bit, yeah. There you go, thank you, Brother Jimmy, you're the best. Thank you, you're awesome, thank you, all right? Because we keep on, uh, yeah, I know we can't, see. can't see the last part of it. Okay, so historical, critical, linguistic, and cultural understanding. This should be the approach. And this has been set by Christian scholars. And yet, people are not following them. Right? Both in hermeneutics and exegesis, Christian scholars have relied upon what is presently known as the literal, Grammatical historical method. Exegesis is the more exact science to unlock these meanings. This is the method, literal, grammatical, and historical method. That's the approach, or that should have been the approach of everyone, but most, most of the readers do not do that. Exegesis as opposed to asegesis, almost the same, but not quite, means to read into, and this is what most people do. They thought they're doing exegesis, but they were doing exegesis, which is they just read it through. Is the center of hermeneutical method. And exegesis uses three approaches to examine the text. Understanding the grammar of the text. We have to understand the grammar of the text. What does it say? Understanding the meaning of individual words in a sentence. Understanding the message as a whole in the context of the paragraph, of the chapter, of the book, of the entire scripture. Meaning that passage cannot and will not contradict any passage in the scripture. Not at all. That is according to exegesis rule. Because the word of God cannot contradict itself. You cannot say that this passage now is newer Therefore, it invalidates the Torah because Paul said the law has been done away with. It cannot be. It violates exegesis rule. And yet, sadly, our pastors who should know better and have studied this keeps on repeating the same mistake, unfortunately. You cannot contradict what was written already. They are interdependent upon one another. They support one another. They do not suppress one another or supersedes one another. They don't. One passage, one particular verse or text cannot invalidate or supersede another text or book. Galatians cannot supersede the Torah. And the Torah will have to support also the book of Galatians. That should have been the rule, right? Exegesis involves scripture translation, but the rules are governed by hermeneutics and biblical theology, meaning a text cannot stand alone 
in the meaning but fits with that within the entire structure of the revealed truth. Alright? When it says here, the law has been done away with, what does it mean? Because now it validates the other passages that says, my law is forever. What are we talking about here? Oh yeah, there is a conflict. Okay? There is no conflict in the Bible. And it doesn't mean that there's no conflict. One yields to another and there's no more conflict. It's not like that. We have to understand it from the perspective of what was written prior. All right? Now, exegesis involves a process examining the text itself, its origin and wording. We scrutinize or scrutiny of translation. We have to scrutinize the translation because a lot of translations, they actually translated the text to fit into their own theology. And I've been questioned many times, do you scrutinize the scripture, the translation? How dare you? It's like the translation is infallible. But why did they kill Tyndale for making a different translation? Why are they forcing it? Why they kill people when a translation is being scrutinized? Right? So we have to criticize because this the translation is man-made. The original, the Hebrew and the Greek, and some portion of the of the um, uh, very few portion of the of the Tanakh has Aramaic. Very, very few. Most of it are Hebrew, right? That one is infallible. But when they translated it, it becomes different. And then you will say, how did you know? Well, the Mormons get their own translation of the Bible. Do you read it? Why don't you read it? Because it fits into their own translation and, and theology. The Jehovah's Witness got their own, right? The Seventh-day Adventists got their own, right? The Catholics got their own. Some evangelicals got their own. They fit into what they think it is. And we don't read them because we think their translation is different. Right? So we will entertain questions later because it's long. So, but we will have, uh, we will have um, uh, Berean's meeting about this. Okay? So we scrutinize the translation. The discovery of historical context the authorship setting and dating. We have to ask questions. Analyze the literary context. What does it say? Determining the genre and literary type. We have to examine this. What if I don't know how to do this? Then you have to study because it is your soul that is at stake. Do not depend your soul to somebody else. Do not depend your soul to me or to your pastor or to, to Brother Jonah or to anybody else. You have to study your own and make sure that it is you understand where you're going to and what you're doing right now. Amen. Outlining and diagramming structure. Classifying of grammar and syntax. Systematically studying a given truth in a setting of revealed truth. We have to study it. Why did he say that? Right? And then we apply the text. When we understood it, then we apply it. Right? There are two misapplications of the text to avoid. Moralizing the passage, which is done almost every day or constantly. Applying a particular moral framework to a, to a verse viewed from a particular vantage point in time. Oh, um, there is no more circumcision. So I'm not going to get circumcised, right? Personalizing the passage in individual's life view dictates the meaning of, and the application. What about those who are practicing circumcision, like the Philippines? So they take it from a different perspective as well. Yeah, we can circumcise, but we don't have to keep the law. Right? The other one, oh, according to Paul, we are not supposed to be circumcised anymore. Right? But those who circumcise, yeah, we can circumcise, but we don't have to keep the law. I mean, you are basing the scripture based on your own opinion, advantage, and position. We don't do that. 
Things to consider. The reader of the biblical text must remember that he, she, is not the original recipient of the book. We are just reading somebody else's letter. Effort must be made to determine how the text may, may have been understood by the original reader. What do they think if, you, if the original reader, if, you know, go into the shoes of the original reader? How did they understand the passage or the letter, right? The book of Galatians were written to the Galatians. Are we Galatians? We don't even understand their culture. What are they talking about? Right? The interpretive community of believers, the ecclesia, constitute the, content, the context of the reading. What are their practices? For example, when the letter to the seven ecclesia in the Asia Minor, what are their practices? They keep they are called quarto decimals. They cannot, uh, we cannot interpret the, the scripture based on our own practices because they practice differently. Since the original authors and hearers are no longer participants in the process, the interpretive interaction takes place between the text and the reader. What does it mean? When you read a, a passage, there is a point that you understand it. But based on what you know, based on your background, culture, and understanding. But the question is, is it right? Oh, the Holy Spirit is with me. That's why there is 48,000 denominations. If the Holy Spirit is in each of these denominations, how come they're all different? Right? And mind you, in each of those denominations, there are still people that contradict with the teaching of that own congregation, but won't leave because... They like the place. So it could be more, right? Things to consider. Since the passage is historical in its composition and presentation, every method, every method must be used to understand its meaning in the light before a rush to applications. We have to understand before we rush about the meaning especially if it seems contradictory with what was written already. Oh, you see, Paul said we are no longer under the law. Yes, right? But you don't even understand what they're talking about. Don't you know that during the time of Paul, in the Greek mindset, if you are not under the law, you are a slave. Slaves are not under the law according to the Paul's culture. Huh? Really? Yes. People can beat you. People can, you know, the rich people who are under the law, they are protected by the law. So the slaves and the pay and the heathen and what have you, they are not covered by the law. Have this pagan work for you and you don't pay him. He cannot go to the authorities and say, he did not pay me. Boy, you are not under the law. You have no claim. You have no right. They do not understand the setting. So when they say, I'm not under the law anymore, is that what Paul is really talking about? Sorry, but you don't know, right? Ultimately, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, sheds light upon the divine truth. And he cannot, and again, he cannot contradict himself. A passage cannot say, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. if, if the Torah was also in, inspired by the Holy Spirit and the book of Galatians was inspired by the Holy Spirit, how come there's conflict? Or is there really a conflict? Or you're making it as a conflict? Yeah. We will study it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Trained biblical scholars in many instances disagree in their interpretation of particular passage. In the church's long history, scholars have disagreed over basic principles of interpretation. Even them, they, they changed. The early church fathers in Alexandria, influenced by Greek philosophical thought, used mainly allegorical method. They are influenced by their customary background, which is Greek philosophy. So they always think everything is allegorical. It's not a direct meaning. It means something else, right? All right? The church fathers in Antioch is different. They use the literal, historical meaning 
with mystical interpretation this time. But think about it. This in Antioch. Remember Antioch? This is where Paul had a little battle with Peter. And, you know, this is where uh, other theologians came. This is where um, uh, Nic uh, Nicholas, the one of the seven uh, deacons, first deacons, this is where Luke came from. They are almost using the same as Pardes. Literal, historical, mystical. The sword. Get it? So you, you can see. The other one, they don't use any other thing except mystical. Uh, allegorical only. Now the Protestant Reformation used direct meaning with the use of Hebrew and Greek grammar. Now they're using the Hebrew and Greek grammar. Right? And of the ancient Near East history. Now they are a little bit more academic. They were the ones who actually formulated the hermeneutics and exegesis. Okay? Many Christians pitfall in biblical interpretation and understand. They are so eager to proclaim what the passage means to their peers. Oh, I discovered this. That they tend to miss what it meant and its original situation. We are no longer under the law. But what Paul is saying is, if you're not under the law, you're a slave. Alright? You are no longer under the law of what? Of sin. You are now a slave to Christ. That's what he was saying. But people don't understand it. They don't get it. Alright? So I'm giving you already what we're going to talk about. These are all backgrounds, right? Many Christians naively accept the doctrines taught by their churches and they carry a preconceived theology when reading a passage and understanding the text based on the bias of the preset idea, they are using the deductive method of study. Meaning, I haven't read the Bible. I was told that the law was done away with. I go to the Bible and all I see are the laws has been done away with. Just like when Sister Paula said when she was driving a car, a, a, a BMW or what have you. All you see is BMW. <laughs> Just like me. When I was driving my Toyota Corolla brown, all I see are either Toyota Corolla or the brown ones. I also see my plate numbers. That's deductive because that's human being. But it's not the way we approach the scripture. The truth is not us. The scripture is the truth and we have to follow it. All right? Before we dwell into exegesis of any biblical passage, we have to agree on the common biblical truth. There should be a basis for everything. Even in courts, there is a basis like, okay, well, let's agree on this particular, you know, things. You did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. We agree. And then from there we battle, right? All scripture is God's breath. All of it. Okay? We agree. The word of God does not change. Right? So meaning it cannot supersede one another. It doesn't change. God, does, God himself does not change. We have, to, we have to put a foundation there. From there, that's where we're going to use it, right? Scripture passages cannot contradict or supersede itself. They have to be the same, right? Scripture is without error. We have to agree on that one, right? The scripture interpret scripture. Right? And the Bible is the sole authority of the truth. There we agree. Right? From there we attack. Right? Okay? Ready? Okay. The Torah is the word of God. Many think that the Torah is the law of Moses. And it is no longer valid because we have the law of Christ. It has no more bearing for us or no longer applicable. Let us examine the scripture whether this is true or not. All right? In James chapter 4, verse 12, it says there that there is only one lawgiver and one judge. What does it mean? If there is one lawgiver and there is one judge, who is the judge of all? Yeshua was given the authority to judge. There is only one judge. How many lawgivers? One. Who gave the law then to Moses? Yeshua. Because there is only one. It cannot be two. Yeah. No, it's the father. Then there will be two lawgivers. No, but they are just one. Come on. Are you, like, are they one person or two persons? 
They are echad. They are not yakid. We have to understand it from the perspective of the Hebrews. When it says, um, Shema Israel, uh, Ad Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Echad, not Yahid. Meaning, Yahid is one, like one piece, like one page. This is Yahid. Now, this is Echad. Is this? So, you have to understand it from that perspective, okay? So, Yeshua is the lawgiver. So therefore, the law of Moses is also the law of Christ. That's why he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because it was his commandments. Alright? Now let us examine the books that Moses wrote and let us see whether it is indeed the law of Moses or the law of the Lord. So for those who, are, who, who did the Bible study already, you know this, right? So total verses per book and the verses spoken by God himself. Proportionality, 12.34% for Genesis. Number of times God spoke, 60 in Genesis. Exodus, 12, uh, 1,213 uh, verses, 551 verses of which God himself spoke. 45.42%, 70 times he spoke. Leviticus, 858 verses. The number of verses God spoke, 806. That's 93.94%. Almost all of Leviticus was actually direct word from God. It's not just inspired to a human being. It was himself speaking. Right? Numbers, 66. Deuteronomy, it becomes smaller because now Moses is re recollecting what has been said. Now, he's now quoting a third, you know, uh, God. But it was Moses' words now. But the total of 37.94% of the Tanakh. Now, how many verses in the book of Galatians, or in the epistles for that matter, did actually God himself speak? Zero. It was all spoken by Paul, inspired by God. Right? What I'm pointing out here is the actual, literal word that came out of God cannot be contradicted by a man only inspired by God, don't you think? So this is a more stronger basis and we have to evaluate the book of Galatians, Romans, Colossians, and what have you and everything from the Torah, which is the actual word of God. Alright? You get it? Did you get that argument? Okay. So we're clear, right? As we can see here, the Torah does not contain does contain a big percentage of direct words of God. The epistles in the New Testament like Galatians, the teachings of the apostles, contain the teachings of the apostles, but the Torah contains the actual words of God. Just like the gospel contains words of Yeshua himself, which is very, very powerful. Right? We have to interpret Galatians and other books in the light of the Torah, not the other way around. Any books in the Bible, including the teaching of Yeshua cannot go against the Torah and will not go against the Torah. There is no words of Yeshua that contradicted the words in the Torah. Right? Luke chapter 20, uh, 2, 22 to 23 and also verse 39 stated that the law of Moses is also the law of the Lord. And that the law of Christ mentioned in Galatians 6, 2, that's the only time it appeared, is also the law of the Lord, as there is only one lawgiver and judge, according to James 4.12. All right? Now, let us understand. Remember hermeneutics, right? We have to understand who's writing. Now, Paul preached in the synagogues in Damascus. Also in Salamis, on the Sabbath day. In Iconium synagogue. He circumcised Timothy. According to the Galatians, it said, if you receive circumcision, you have, you have fallen out of grace. Huh? He just circumcised Timothy here too. Did he repent? We have to understand whether that is what Paul is saying. Because he cannot also contradict himself, can he? After saying, oh, but he's a Jew, but you know, Timothy is a Jew. But he's half a Jew, but he's also half a Gentile. So he should only receive half a circumcision. Don't you think? 
If that is the argument, right? But that's not the case. What is, what is um, Paul was saying when he said, if you receive circumcision, you fell out of grace. Christ is of no use to you. What does he mean by that? Remember physics? It means laxity before? The circumcision during this time means something else as well that we do not understand because we do not know the Hebraic roots of our faith. Because our, uh, our um, anti nicene fathers, not the anti nicene but, you know, the church fathers rejected the Hebrew roots, cut us off, and from there, we've been floating in the sea. Right? And by God's mercy only, we are here. Paul, according to his customs, go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, Acts 17. He still has a custom to go to a Sabbath day? I thought it's done away with already. We have to understand what he's doing. If he seems to be saying something and doing something else, it's either he's moron or, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, something else, or maybe we misinterpret him. And most likely I would side to misinterpretation of Paul. Yeah. All right? He went three times to synagogue on the Sabbath in Thessalonica. He went to the uh, synagogue of the Berea. He's taught in the synagogue in Athens. Where, where's the church here? I don't see yet, right? Paul was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath in the Corinth. And for one and a half years, he did. I still don't see the church, right? It's always synagogue and on the Sabbath. How come Luke was very silent about Paul going to a Sunday church? Because he never did. Otherwise, Luke would have written it. We have to think. We have to think. Right? Paul kept a Nazarite vow and completed it in Achaia. Achaia. Acts 18.18. 18. The law is done away with and he's still doing a Nazarite vow? Huh. Check the verses. Paul attended synagogue in Ephesus for three months. Paul intending to leave, uh, uh, intending to be in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. I thought the law is done away with already. If you follow the law, you're, Christ is of no use to you. Why is he keep on doing this? And he did all these things after writing the book of Galatians. What's wrong with him? Or is there something wrong with him or with us? Or with the people who think that he, he did otherwise? Think. This is exegesis. This is hermeneutics. We have to understand it from that perspective. Luke recorded that there was a misconception about Paul teaching to forsake the law, not to circumcise, but James testified and belied these allegations according to Acts 21, 15 to 24. Paul performed again a Nazarite vow twice. Purification rites, and he even made a sacrifice. In the temple, Acts 21, 23 to 26. What's wrong with Paul now? Oh, that's the lowest part of his Paul's life. No, no, no. Uh, you know, to the Jews, he becomes a Jew. And to the Gentile, he becomes a Gentile. Huh? Is he a switch? But people put words in Paul's mouth and make him and just reflect their theology as if Paul was the one telling them. But Paul was following the Torah. Let's examine it in Acts 21. Right? And this is his third missionary journey, right? All right? Acts 21, uh, verse 20. And when they heard it, they, become, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands are there among the Jews to those that believe, and they are all zealous for the law. And they had been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, Telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to the custom. That was the misinterpretation even during Paul's time. Right? Yet, he said, what then is to be done? Verse 22. They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Verse 24. Take them and purify yourself along with them. And pay their expenses in order that they may shave their heads. And all will know. That there is nothing to these things which they have told about you, 
but you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. Why did Luke write that particular verse? Because he was helping Luke, uh, that Paul, to he was helping Theophilus to understand that Paul is keeping the law. Right? Paul was sitting in the temple for seven days. Paul spoke in Hebrew. Paul in his defense never mentioned that the law has been abolished or replaced as alleged by his accusers. He could have easily said that the law has been done away with. He could have said that, right? Why did he belie it? Because it's not true. Why did Luke wrote all those specific defense of Paul? We have to ask ourselves why. Because it is not true. They misunderstood him. That's why. He's saying this is all lie. I did not say that the law has been done away with. He was defending himself. All right? We, this is exegesis. We have to understand why they, wrote, why they wrote what they wrote. Right? Okay. Paul belied again the accusation against him regarding the law in the temple. Why he keeps on belying it if it is not true, right? But if it is true. Paul did not admit the accusations against him with regards to the abolition of the law. It's there. Check the verses. And Paul belied that he violated Jewish customs. He was still doing the Jewish customs. Alright? So now we understand Paul's action. We know that the word of God is fixed. It's true. Now we see that Paul was doing, doing the law. Now let us see what is Paul's concept about the law. Alright? going to try to make it fast. These are all introduction. Paul made himself clear that there are many laws when he asked by what kind of law? Romans 3.27. He asked in Romans 3.27, but what kind of law? Meaning there are many laws according to his mind, right? And these are the laws in his mind. The law of faith, Romans 3.27. The law of works, Romans 3.28, which the translators made it works of the law. Why did they have to do that? It becomes, he, Paul is contrasting the law of faith to the works of the law? No. He is contrasting law of faith to the law of works. Let's examine Romans 3.27 uh, really quickly. So, so that you will understand what, what is being said here. Okay? Romans 3.27. When, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? Meaning law of works. Right? Because he is asking what kind of law? Of works? No. Right? That's what he said. Uh, where am I? Uh, no. But by the law of faith. So therefore, he is contrasting between the law of faith and the law of works. And yet our great translators made it the works of the law. Now they are comparing... The works versus the law of faith. It's not right. Anyway, it's law of faith, law of works. There is a law of sin. There is a law of God. There is a law of spirit of life. There is law of mind. Then there are laws of the Jews. Seven laws in the book of Romans. We will not discuss this in details. We will discuss this in some other time. But what I'm saying to you is the false concept about the law. We understood that he keep the law. Then now we have to understand what is his concept about the word law. It's seven different laws. And we have to understand what kind of law he's talking about. Right? Now, let's go to the Galatians now. We understand now the concept of it. Right? The epistles to the Galatians, often shortened to Galatians, is the ninth book of the New Testament. Remember, this is about Galatians. I just told you about the background so you will understand. You just don't take a verse and make a theology out of it. Alright? And we have to, to take the pain of understanding so that we understand. Rather than dwell into it and without rule, we just interpret whatever we want. Right? So, it is a letter from Paul the Apostle to a number of early Christian communities in the Galatia. Scholars have suggested that this is either a Roman province of Galatia in southern Anatolia, or a large region defined by the ethnic group of Celtic people in central Anatolia. Listen to this. 
No original of the letter is known to survive. No original letter. The earliest reasonable complete version available to scholars today, named P46, dates approximately 200 AD, which is about 100, roughly about 150 years after the original was presumably drafted. They don't even have the original. How did we know that it was really written by Paul? We have to think about it. So we have to already understand that if indeed it was written by Paul, then the better reference, which is the Torah, should take the precedent, should be more, has more weight rather than this, right? You're not even sure if he wrote it. But let's assume that he wrote it, okay? But see, there's a doubt already. But again, I'm going to tell you that there's no conflict. But people need to understand. The problem is they put the Torah down and put a, the Galatians like, yeah, it's, everything's done. See here? They don't even have the original, right? Show that to the courts if it will even yeah. accept it. Right? The courts right now, but yet the people who, who supposedly had the mind of God because they have the spirit do not think properly, right? Some scholars date the original composition between 50 to 60. I got a problem with this, right? Anyway, other scholars agree that Galatians was written between the 40 and early 50s. See, even our scholars do not think properly. You know why? I'll show you why. In Galatians itself, the, 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 he was telling a story, right? It's already 17 years. If it is 50 or 40, when was he converted? Before, before Yeshua died? They, uh, it's, I don't know if they know math or what. It's everything is in Galatians. Galatians. 17. Say, for example, 1947, uh, like 47 AD, right? If it is 47 AD, meaning he got converted at AD 30, when Yeshua was still starting his ministry, right? This, <laughs> they don't think. That's why do not depend your soul in these people. You ha we have to study the scripture by ourselves. All right? Now let us study the book of Galatians, focusing on several highlights of the epistle. I'm not going to, I'm going to just go through it and point out certain things only, right? Game. Galatians 1.6, I marvel that you are soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another. Which is not another. Do you understand that passage? <laughs> I marvel, read it from your own Bible. Don't, don't look here because I got a clue already, right? Don't cheat. <laughs> okay, Galatians 1.6. Okay. I am amazed that you are quickly deserting him who is called by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. But there are some who are disturbing you who want to distort the gospel of Christ. I'm confused with that. Like, it's another, but it's not another. <laughs> Listen, the word, the first another is actually heteros which means altered or strange. All right? The other another is alos. Remember in Revelation, the alos agilos? It's a different. It's two different words. This one has been altered, and this one is different because now they trouble you. They altered it. Okay? Yeah, because they receive apparently a strange gospel, right? Okay. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Why did he say that? Are angels preaching? But think about this. Among the ancient books, the book of Enoch is actually saying that. But of course, we don't use the book of Enoch because it's not part of the gospel, right? But is Paul using it? Yes, he did. All right? But anyway, we're not going to use it. We're not going to argue with it. We're going to focus on Galatians. Because you don't see any scripture or any ancient text that says an angel is preaching. Right? So what is he saying? Anyway, as we said before, um, now I say again, if any man preach any other gospel, unto you that you have received, let him be accursed. 
Now, period of the writing of epistle, 17 years. Galatians 1.17 I went to Jerusalem and were apostles before me and I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. We don't know how long this is. And yet in 18, it says, three years after, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. Three years now, right? And then, 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Remember, he wrote Galatians after these things happened, not before. So meaning, 14 plus 3, 17. So where did, when did he write this? Why did they say early 40s, early 50s? People are not thinking. It's a simple math, right? <laughs> and then you, you entrust your soul to them. Encounter with Peter. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I here, this is what they said. I withstood him to the face. Very harsh, eh? Because he was to be blamed. It's like putting Peter once again, like, because he... He uh, betrayed, uh, he, he denied Yeshua, so he's, Peter is wrong. You know, so he has to be confronted to his face. Yeshua did not even confront Peter to his face. The Greek word is antis, antestimi, otos prosopon, which means I oppose him in his presence. I talked to him and, Brother Michael, I don't think you did it right. He did not, I did not say, I put go to Brother Michael to his face and said, you're wrong. They, they wrote it in a way that you were like, wow. Paul is like hitting the guy who has the key. Right? Remember? Yeah. From now on, you will be called Petros, Peter. Oh, really? And the gates of hell cannot overcome you. He was given the task. He was the head. Yeah. And yet Paul is like, Telling him to his face, which I withstood him because he was wrong. And I'm always right. Is that the way Paul said it? No, I oppose him to his face. It's like, Peter, I think you're wrong. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, the ethnos from the nations. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing. Look at this word they used, fearing. Why would... Peter, the head, fear the, the guys of James. Why would Peter fear? Come on, right? Think about it. Who are the big boys here? You got Peter there. You got Barnabas there. Right? And, and, and they will fear the, the disciples of James. But the word there is uh, phobeo, which also means to revere. They kind of, oops. Now, let's respect them. Let's uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, maybe, you know, it's like this. You're from, we are all from other nations, right? Yeah. We eat whatever. Maybe spoon and fork, yeah? And then the Canadians came. Oop, then we changed to just the fork. <laughs> because we respect them. Right? Or we're kind of like, we raise our feet while we eat and use our hands. And then when, when the group of, you know, the socialite people comes, right? That's what they did. But Peter, or but Paul was offended. He still opposed it. But we, you know, we have to understand it from the proper perspective. This, this is what hermeneutics means. Exegesis, we have to examine the text. What does the original, mean, uh, original word mean? Did they really fear? Why would they fear? Will he be like terminated from the group? Come on. He is Peter. The right hand, right? The head. People just don't think, right? But they misinterpret it so that Paul would appear to be above Peter. Look at how, unfortunately, I hope they don't mean this, but that's what is going on. People are now Believing more of Paul, even against the other apostles, and even worse, when Yeshua said, I did not come to abolish the law, but come to fulfill. But Peter said, but Paul said this. Yeshua has the customs of following the Sabbath. But, Peter, uh, but Paul said that, you know, the law is done away with. They put Paul's word above everything else. All right? And you have to understand where they were coming from. These are the Martianites. They put Paul above everybody else. All the rest of the apostles were secondary 
to Paul, Marcion, the son of a bishop, and he was a very powerful um, uh, leader during the time. All right? And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, in so much that Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. So it's more of revere. They revere. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, See how gentle it is? It, it depends on how you read it. Right? If thou being a Jew, livest among the manner of the Gentiles and not do as the Jews do, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? Do you understand what it means? Yes. Good, if you do. But for others, I'm going to tell you, right? This is a very gentle rebuke. It's not like I oppose him to his face. No. I oppose him in his presence. Right? What is the truth of the gospel? The truth of the gospel is that the Jews and the non-Jews are one in Messiah. What does this phrase mean? If thou, being a Jew, livest among the manners of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? It means that Peter lives in the manner of the non-Jews when he was with them. In the manner. Not the sinful manner, but their manners. Probably he's like, instead of using food and pork, he's using maybe his hands. I don't know. But they were together. See, in the Gentiles, it doesn't matter whom they eat, or eat with, right? But among the Jews, it is in the, in the Talmud, not in the Tanakh, not in the Torah, that you cannot eat with the non-Jews. That's at least one of those, right? So, it means that Peter lives in the manner of the non-Jews when he was with them and not doing the Jewish things. He was not doing the Jewish things. So why compel the non-Jews to live like a Jew? If you can actually live like them, like say for example like Christians, well, so why do you make Christians like a Jew? Right? So does it mean that we don't have to wear this anymore and this? What it means is doing the Talmud, doing the laws of the Jews, not the, not the Torah, but meaning you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. You know, on the Shabbat, you exactly light at 6.05, you know, and after this prayer, you know, you cannot even blow it. You have to, so many rules, right? But the question is, why is he trying to convert the Jew, uh, make the Jews do like the non-Jews or the other way around? Why he's making the non-Jews do the manners of the Jews? Because they revere the other side of the group, right? Not fear them. Galatians 2.15, who, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, what does this phrase mean? Does it mean that the Jews do not sin? It says here, not sinners of the Gentiles. Not at all. They are also sinners of the Jews. <laughs> he just did not say it. He implied it. We are not the sinners of the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles, they do other things too. But we are also sinners of the Jews. We do sin. Right? But they are sinners, but not like the pagan. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, Ergonomos, which can also mean the law works, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, even when we believe in Yeshua HaMashiach, that we might be justified by faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. That's a problem. They translated it works of the law rather than the law of works. So it becomes the law is now the, the enemy instead of the works. It's the law now, right? Uh, for, listen to this. For it is not by the law of works, but for the law of works shall no flesh be justified. It should have been like that, right? But they, they had it the other way. They are now against the law rather than the works. Did you get it? Okay. But we are justified by Christ. We ourselves are found sinners, and therefore Christ is a minister of sin. God forbid. For if I build again things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. What did Paul destroy? Surely not the law of God, for he wants to establish it. What did he destroy? By discipline, the law of sin in him. He said that in Romans. I died in this, so that I may live to God. Right? For, I actually said it here. For I, for I through the law, am dead to the law. What is this law? Law of God? No. 
we, we can see that He's been doing all those laws of God. It's the law of sin that I might live to God. Paul made it clear in Romans 6, 1 and 2. Let's read it Ro really quickly. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live on it? So what he destroyed here is the law of sin, not the law of God. We have to understand what he's talking about. That's why I have to go through the pain of, of making you understand of what, his, what is his thought pattern, what is his custom, what does he think. Why did, what, what were he, you know, the best thing to know a person's theology is by looking at what he's doing. If he says, keep the commandments, and then you eat pork, you eat shrimp, you eat, excuse me? Right? We have to do the action and the word at the same time, right? So Paul followed all the commandments. So therefore, he must mean something else in here. So the law here is the law of sin, not the law of God. For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If later when, when we do the uh, exegesis of Romans, you will see the contrast of the law of works and the law of faith. That's why he keeps on repeating it in all his writing. Okay? I do not frustrate the grace of God, for, it, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So what is he saying now? What kind of law again? Right? Surely it's not the law of sin because the law of sin does not have righteousness. Don't you think? Is Paul contradicting Deuteronomy 6.25? Can you check that right now? Deuteronomy 6.25. But of course, Brother Jonah knows that by heart. Deuteronomy 6.25. Right? It says, that it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God, just as He commanded us. So is Paul contradicting now Deuteronomy 6.25? Which law is he referring here? Matthew 5.20 refers to the righteousness of the Pharisees that are based on the law of the Jews and not the law of God. Check it out if you can understand Matthew 5.20. Matthew 5.20. It says there, Unless, for I say unto you, unless your, your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what kind of righteousness do we have? Our own righteousness, which is based on our own judgment, or the righteousness of God in Deuteronomy 6.25? So when the only thing that can surpass the Pharisees' righteousness is the righteousness in Deuteronomy 6.25, which is the righteousness of God, which is the commandments of God, not the commandments of the rabbi, not the commandments of the Pharisees, not the laws of the Talmud. It falls short. All right, you're getting it? All right. It's the laws of the Jews, not the law of God, right? Oh, foolish Galatians, they always put me this to my face. It's like, oh, foolish Richard. Somebody wrote a letter to me like that. Oh, foolish Richard. Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Yeshua HaMashiach had been evidently set forth crucified among you? This only would I learn of you received yet by the Spirit, by the works of the law. Should have been the law of works, right? By hearing of faith, see, works and faith should have been contrasted, not the law and the faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are ye now made perfect in the flesh? Did you forget something? Why did Paul call the Galatians foolish? Did he not read Matthew 5.22? Read it. Matthew 5.22. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. But whoever shall say to you, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go to the fiery hell. Did Paul forget that? Or Paul is exempted to it because he's this. Or 
maybe our translators made a little bit, a little bit of, mm, right? The word used there is anuetus, which also means unwise. He did not say foolish. He said, you are unwise, my fellow Galatians, meaning you're not wise anymore. Because that's, this is exegesis. You have to examine the text. Why did he say something that contradicts the word of Yeshua himself that says, do not say to anybody a fool? Because Paul never said it. It was our good translators who did it. And now it is being placed to us, those who hated us, our detractors, and would always put Galatians 3.1, Oh, foolish Galatians. It's like you, oh, foolish messianics. You who foolish Richard. It was said to me many times. But they have better read Matthew 5.22. They have to be very careful. The word there is unwise. Have you suffered so many things in vain yet? In vain? Why did they suffer? He therefore that ministereth you uh, the Spirit and worketh miracles among you doeth it by the works, by the law works, or by the hearing of faith. Right? Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, believe, that's the problem. And this has been corrected by James too. The problem with us is when we say believing, it's like, yeah, I believe. I won't do anything because I believe. I stand still and not do anything because I believe. <clears throat> Abraham believing God did not mean doing nothing, but rather it was shown in action. Acts 26, 5, that's the very passage, and was further explained by James in his epistles. James 2, 19 to 24. It's our works that justifies us that we have faith. See, Abraham has a choice to believe in many other gods. He got this opportunity that, that one true God of, Abraham, of, of, uh, of Noah and, and, and Shem was introduced to him at an early age. But he came back to his father with all those idols. Now there are different gods here, plus the one true God. Then he tested it. He tested the, the, the idols. Never worked. Then he tested the, the one true God. By doing that, what did he do? Did he do anything? Of course he did. Read, um, I think it's in the next passage. Okay. Anyway, we'll read this and then I'll explain further. You know therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abram. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, through faith preached before the gospel unto Abram, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abram. The righteous shall live by faith. Right? Now, I want you to understand that uh, if you go to uh, Genesis 26.5, Abraham believing didn't mean doing nothing. When he believed, meaning he followed his ways. I'll give you an example. Brother Jonah would say something. Brother Michael would say something. Sister Maria would say something. Uh, Brother Argy would say something. Now, whom will I believe? He would say, come and join me and go somewhere else. Brother Michael would say the same thing. If I believe, say for example, in Brother Argy, it's not I stand here and yes, I believe in you. And that's it. I will have to follow him where he goes. Meaning doing his ways, doing his customs, following his statutes and ordinances and everything. That's what Abraham did. Believing means doing the commandments of that person you are believing. Right? So Genesis 26.5, Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. This is what believing means. That's why it says believing is righteousness. God, um, um, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Believing did not mean in action. It means he did all those things. He kept my charge. He obeyed my laws. 
my statutes and my commandments. That's what believing means. Now, if, if you are children of Abram, do the deeds of Abram. All right? The righteous shall live by faith. For as many as are of the works of the law. See, they keep on repeating it yeah. under the curse. It's, it's not the law that is at the problem, it's the works. For it is the re written, curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. What does it mean? Right? But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Which law? Right? We have to understand, what is he talking about? That's the law of men. That's the law of the Jews. Right? Because otherwise, the statement of Yeshua, when he was approached by a young man, how can I enter the, yes. inherit the kingdom? Keep the commandments. Yes. Oh, but Paul said this. We have to understand what Paul is talking about. And yet, after Paul said this, he keeps on doing all those things. It's like, it's like pointing us to a different direction, but he's doing something else. So that saves himself and we are all in trouble. No, it's not like that, right? The law is not of faith. What is that law? Remember, he's, he's um, um, uh, um, uh, comparing the law of works and the law of, the law of faith. The man that doeth them shall live in them. So which law he is referring now? Obviously the law of the Jews or the law of works, right? We have to understand what he's talking about. He sh keeps on shifting. The problem is Paul was a very intelligent man. That's, it's like Brother Jonah, right? Brother Jonah is a very intelligent man, and sometimes he talks things that he himself only understands, and we don't. But we have to ask him and understand, what do you mean by that? Then he teaches us, right? It, sometimes he speaks higher than what we can think. And sometimes, it, but it doesn't mean that he's wrong, Right? Paul was even twice or ten times more wise than Brother Jonah. And he got like this training that nobody, not even among the apostles had. So sometimes he talked about things that he thought you understand, but he did not. But, but listen, the people whom he was writing to knew because he trained them. Right? So when he gives a little clue, he knows already what they're talking about. Right? Just like here, when my dad would say, what is the conclusion of the matter? We know that he's to, to fear God and keep his commandments. We know the answer. But if he would say that somewhere else in a, in a street, and then somebody's talking and he approached him, what is the conclusion of the matter? I don't know. <laughs> right? They don't know what they're talking about. We have to understand it from the perspective of the hearers. All right? I'll make it a little bit faster. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, curses everyone that hang on a tree. The curses of the law was stipulated in Deuteronomy 28, 15 to 68 with a simple beginning statement. If you refuse to do these commandments, let's read it, the first part only, Deuteronomy 28, 15. Deuteronomy 28, 15. But it shall come about if you will not obey the Lord your God to observe all his commandments and his statutes, which I charge to you today, that all these curses come upon you and overtake you. That's the curse of the law. If you do not obey it, right? The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Yeshua Mashiach, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet it be confirmed, no man disannulleth, or added thereto. What can we see in this text? They do not even bother to read this text because they do not see it. They're driving a Toyota Corolla brown. They only see the brown. They do not see the red, the white, the blue, the silver. What does it mean? Even in the man's command uh, covenant, once it is done, you cannot add or remove or annul it. It's done. How much more the command, the covenant of God. Do you understand that? All right? So meaning, the commandments of the Lord cannot be annulled. It has been done. It has been covenanted. It has been finished. So therefore, it has to be implemented. All right? 
Now to Abraham and his seeds were promise made. He saith not unto his seeds as many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promises of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, there is no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. But the thing, though, is, when he was given the promise, when he, when he obeyed God, he also kept the commandments. So when we receive the promise, it doesn't exclude us or excuse us not to keep his commandments. Did you see that? Did Abraham keep the commandments? Yes, he did. Did he receive the promise? Yes, he did. Which did he do first? The commandment or the promise? <laughs> right? So it goes hand in hand. Right? So... For if the inheritance be of the law, it's no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to know the promise was made, and was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Alright? So, the law of God is necessary to put everything in order. Because look at our Christian brethren who doesn't even obey the own law, their own law of exegesis. It's chaotic. They interpret it one after another. It's like, what are they talking about? All right? Is the law against the promises of God? God forbid. You see that? Paul said it. The law is not against the promises of God, for it has been a law given which could have been given life. Verily, righteousness should have been based by the law. He said that. The righteousness is based by the law. But the scripture had concluded all under sin. Why? Because everybody are violators of the law. And the promise by faith of Yeshua Mashiach might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, right? Shut up by the faith and unto the faith which should have afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. What is the law Paul referring this time? It is the law of the Jews. He was trained by Gamaliel for how he can see Yeshua in the scriptures if he was not trained prior to his conversion. If he was, um, sorry for the word, uh, I don't want to use the word uh, moron. I'm going to use if he's uh, ignorant, right? <laughs> if he's ignorant, no education, how can he see Christ? The, the way he, is, he saw him, right? It was used by the Lord so that he can see it from that perspective. Okay? So it was our schoolmaster. That's why this is what I'm saying. We also don't detest. Um, I would say we, just, we also should not detest uh, our old teachers. Because they kept, from, they kept us from the truth. But they were our schoolmaster so that we can see what we see now. Right? If we did not go through Christianity, mainstream Christianity, some from Catholics first, then they went to evangelicals, and then they, now they are in Messianic. If they did not go through it, they will, you will never see this. Right? So, but of course they are in the wrong, but just like the law of the Jews is in the wrong, but it was used as a schoolmaster to learn about the Messiah. But only those who leave that are from the Lord. Those, of course, that are left behind are not from the Lord because they cannot hear the voice, right? But after that faith is come, we are no longer under schoolmaster, for you are all children of God by faith in Messiah Yeshua. For as many of you had been baptized in Messiah, put on the Messiah, neither a Jew nor Greek, nor band or free, neither male or female, you are all one in Christ Jesus, Yeshua Mashiach. But if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Right? So, for now I say that the heir, as long as the child is different, uh, nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but he is under a tutor, governors, until the time appointed of the father. We were there also in Christianity up to certain time. And then the Lord opened our eyes, and then now we can see. Amen. So we don't hate them. We love them. And bring the message to them. 
And those that the Lord will open their eyes, the eyes belongs to the Lord. Those who don't, let's not be mad at them. They will call us this, they will call us that, but that's okay. Because they don't know what they're doing. Alright? Now you have a better understanding of the book of Galatians, right? Howbeit that you knew not God, or ye the service by which by nature are no gods. This passage actually speaks that the, the Galatians were not Jewish. They were pagan Gentiles. But of course there were some Jews there, but mostly they were pagan. They, they, they know no God. They, they have no God. They have many gods actually, but they don't know the real God, right? So tell me ye that desire to be under the law. Do you not hear? Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, and one by a bandmaid and the other by a free woman. So I'm gonna tell you this. Those who wants to be under the law, what law? The law of the Jews. Right? Because I'm gonna tell you why. Let's examine the text. Abraham had two sons, one by a bandmaid, the other one by a free woman. But he was one, but who was of the bandwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by a promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, one from the Mount Sinai, which gen gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem. Who is in Jerusalem? The Jews who has the Talmud. Right? Which now is in the bondage with her children. Who are her children? The Jewish who are following the man's law. Right? But Jerusalem which is above. What is above? It's in heaven. It's free which is a mother of us all. So what it means here, the band woman is represented by those who keep the Talmudic law. They are in bondage. Because if you don't do this, you don't do that, they like, you're out. Right? There is, but our law is free. It's different. We, we, we do not do them because we are so afraid. We do them because we love Yeshua. Right? Okay? So, um, stand fast therefore in liberty wherein Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Entangled again. But they were pagans. The, the law of the Jews were not their law before, but they were under the law of the pagans before. Now they will be, they had been set free, right? Now they're putting themselves again to the yoke of the bondage of the Jewish law, which is man-made law. All right? Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall be of no profit to you. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he's a debtor to that whole law. What is he talking about? <laughs> again, physics, it was laxity before. Right? What is circumcision here is conversion to Judaism. Because here's the thing. There are two gears during the time. During the time of Paul, the Ger to Shav and the Ger Tzedek. The Ger to Shav are God fearers. They keep, they honor the God of Israel. They keep the commandments of God, except they they are not circumcised. According to the law, that was Cornelius, right? He's God fearer. But according to the law of the Jews, Peter should not have entered his house, because that's the Talmud. All right, get it? Now, the Ger Tzedek are the proselytes. They honor the, the God of Israel, they keep the commandments, and then they get circumcised and follow now the customs and the traditions of the Talmudic law. Now, they, they are not only proselytes, they are actually Jews. They are converts. They are now Jews, right? That's the difference. Paul was saying this already. You don't need to convert to Judaism to be saved. You don't. Because if you do, they will lead you astray because they don't have the Messiah in them. Get it? Now, it says here, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. What is that whole law? 
That is the Talmudic law. But if they prefer that to be the law of God, then those who are circumcised will have to keep the whole law of God, which they reject. Right? And fortunately or unfortunately, I am circumcised, so I'm obligated to keep the whole law. So those pastors and preachers and those who are against the law, especially in the Philippines, they are all circumcised, so why are they circumcised? And why are they letting their children be circumcised when they don't want to keep the law? It says here, every man that is circumcised is a debtor to do the whole law. Be careful what you reject. Christ has become of no effect to you, right? For whosoever um, of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace, for which the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Messiah Yeshua neither circumcision availeth anything, nor our, or uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love, yet did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. All right? Brethren, you had been called unto liberty. Only use, liber uh, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another, for the, all the law is fulfilled in one word. Now, which law is he referring to again? He keeps on changing. Can't you see that? You just have to understand. It's like a code. Like you have to have a code to understand what he's talking about. Now, he's talking about the law of God. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. He quoted the law. Because that's the law. The law of God. The Torah. Then I say, walk in the spirit. Ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit. So he's con construct, uh, contrasting it. The spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you cannot do things that you would. But ye be led by spirit. So you are no longer under the law. Of what? Of sin. So we have to understand what he's talking about. Right? Now you're getting it. Good. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are this. The works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, violence, emulation, and all these things. Right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. What law is he speaking here? The law of sin. Good. <laughs> Get it. I love it. Now here's the thing. Bear ye one another's burden so you fulfill the law of Christ. Now this is, this is another interesting passage. That's why I put this here. Verse 2 of Galatians chapter 6. Bear ye one's, one another's burdens so you fulfill the law of Christ. And then in the verse 5 it says, For every man shall bear his own burden. What? You just said it that we're going to carry each other's burden. Now we're going to carry our own burden now. What's wrong with our translator? Did you see that? Wow. It's oxymoronic, but is it? Now let's examine using exegesis what does it mean in the original Greek. Right? The word burden here are two different Greek words with, with different meanings. The first one is baros. Bear one another's baros, which means weight or load. And the second one is port, portion, which is an invoice. Every man shall bear his own invoice. Let's read Galatians 6.4. Invoice. It's like what you have done. 6.4. Galatians 6.4. Yeah, now you're getting it. Galatians 6.4. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have uh, reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. It's are the things that we do. And then it was written, then we have an invoice. When when you have some when you when you have worked or you have delivered something or you've carried something, it's all listed and done, it's given to you. That's your invoice. You have to pay for it. It's either it's a reward or a punishment. Huh? Right? As many as desire to make fair shoe of the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest that they should suffer, almost done, uh, for the cross of Christ. Neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Look at Romans 2, 25 to 29. Now what they're talking about here. 
right? But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Yeshua Mashiach, by whom the world is crucified unto me and unto the world. For in Christ Yeshua, uh, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. Yes. We should carry each other's burden here, which is actually baros. Meaning, if you have a problem, I'll help you out, right? right? right. And, and if I have a problem, you help me out, right? But the, the here, the other one burden here is actually port, portion, portion, which is my own work. <laughs> Things that I did, I carry it, whether it's good or bad. I will be given an invoice. There is an angel writing. Oh, you did, did good, you did bad, you did good, you did bad, you did good, 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 bad, 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 good, bad, good. So that's an invoice. Huh? Exactly. That's why he said, now, you know, you can boast if it is good, and you're going to suffer if it is bad. All right? So invoice is a payday, right? So that's the thing. So, all right, so I hope and pray that though it is long, but you have understood the most controversial and the most difficult book in the scripture. And by the Lord's grace, the word, His words will be kept in our heart and we will not depart from it. And we know now that the book of Galatians was never in contradictory with the Torah or the rest of the scriptures. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Avino Malkainu, our Father and our King, we praise you, magnify your name, and honor you for your most worthy of praise. We thank you, Lord, because we know that your word does not change and will never change. As you do not change, you're not like a man that changes, O oh Lord. And your word will not come back unfulfilled. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for you have given us wisdom and understanding so that we can see. And you have opened our ears that we can hear. And you have changed our hearts, a heart of stone into a heart of flesh, so that we will understand. And you have written your commandments in our hearts. Heavenly Father, we pray that may you multiply your words in our hearts and never, so that we will never depart from them. And we pray that may you multiply your words in our congregation, in our midst. And may you be glorified, magnified, and be praised forever and ever. For this we pray in Yeshua's most precious name. For he is our Adonai, our Master and Savior. Amen.